Today is one of those days where I am the a-hole. I own a car dealership. I am always going to be a bad guy. And in today's situation, it's a what would you do situation. I, I love to hear your opinions. I'm gonna tell you all the good, all the bad, both sides of the story, and I'm holding nothing back. And I'd love to hear who's right, who's wrong, and not even that, because I don't know that anybody's right or wrong, but how would you handle this situation? If you were a business owner, if you were me, what's a realistic expectation from the customer? I like to show you all the ins and the outs of owning a car dealership, including the bad, which is what today's video is about. My name is Craig from Flying Wheels. Let's get going. Welcome to Flying Wheels. I own a small car dealership in Danville, New Hampshire, and I pride myself on being a family-owned small business. I have three kids, I'm married, I am the business. I, I have a lot of, lot of really, really great help, but without me, it wouldn't run. And part of owning a good business is being a reputable business and taking care of your customers. And I really, really try to take care of my customers. Buying used cars and selling used cars is really difficult. And a lot of times I preach about like, oh, look at this car, look at how fun it was to buy it look how fun the auction is look at how much money we made on this car yeah that's that's all great and that's true there's a lot of downfalls to owning a business as well especially owning a used car dealership because I'm buying used cars I don't have a crystal ball I don't know why that car was traded in to someone else I don't know why it was at the auction I don't know what customer lied to me about what when they traded it in what they were trying to hide from me all of that is my job to figure out and like I just don't know everything about every car it's impossible nobody does unless you are the previous owner you never know and even the previous owner they're not car people all the time so even they don't always know and there's a reason people are selling their cars and it's my job to figure out why let me cut to the chase and, and I'm going to get to today's scenario this right here is a 2008 Jeep Wrangler I love Jeep Wranglers I do a lot of Jeep Wranglers and this video isn't specifically about this Jeep Wrangler it's about Jeep Wranglers in general now this is a 2008 Jeep Wrangler that came with a 3.8 liter V6 in 2012 Chrysler Jeep changed the engine to a 3.6 liter Pentastar V6. So they went down in displacement, they increased the horsepower, and they actually increased the fuel economy too. It's a pretty smooth running engine. It's the same one that's in the like the Dodge Grand Caravans and the Chrysler Town and Countries and tons and tons of Chrysler products. It has a 3.6 liter V6, including the Grand Cherokees, everything. While those engines are known to have lifter problems, they tick, they tap, not a big deal. You can replace the lifter, a couple hundred bucks, a couple hours labor, no big deal. Actually, the lifter's like $10 and then it's a couple hours labor. We can do in house not a big deal at all and I know when I'm buying them I can hear the lifter tapping I know what's entailed it's not a big deal and I am not afraid of buying them I bought a Jeep Wrangler from the auction 2012 Jeep Wrangler unlimited really really clean Jeep ran great drove it back to my shop no issues like it's a nice Jeep now one of the great things is I bought it like you'll see the weather's nice I bought it before the weather was nice there's still snow on the ground so I bought it right because like I don't want to be buying convertibles when the sun's out I want to be buying the convertibles when the snow's on the ground that way I can sell them when the sun is out I pay like I get a better price when it's snowing like I can buy things at a discount when I'm buying them in the off season so I bought a 2012 Jeep Wrangler that was really really nice and I paid a great price for it we put it through our shop we serviced it I did a bunch of work I mean we spent nearly $900 in services and updates to make it inspectable and then we had it detailed I listed it for sale below market value because it was still early in the season and I still could make like two thousand twenty five hundred dollars off the car and sell it quickly which is what I did so I listed it for sale I put it up on Facebook marketplace and Facebook and one of my friends actually saw it a really uh, like a, a re one of my best customers might even be watching this video so hello there recommends me to everybody and that's a very important part of the story like he has his friends sell their cars to me he has his friends buy their cars for me anytime somebody needs something car related I'm the first name which is just so awesome and that's that's really an important part of the story because that's what I thrive like I try to be that way I want that recognition as people go I got a guy he's awesome you don't want to ruin that which is why this is so important and such an important part now I told you I'm gonna tell you both sides of the story because I want like honest opinions I want to know like what would you do in this situation how would you handle it. The guy asked me, is this thing safe? Would you put your family in it? How are these engines? And I answered truthfully. I said, I buy a ton of Jeep Wranglers. They're awesome. They're fun. They're like, you can use them all year long. So she's safe in the snow. She's safe in an accident. It's reliable. Like that's a good engine. And yeah, I, I would drive it. I buy Jeeps all the time and I would drive this. So that's important. I said that personally. So we 
agreed. He bought the car. I said, give me a couple days. I'll do these items for you. I'll call you when it's done. You can come back and grab it. That's what happened. He came back and grabbed it. Didn't even make it to his house. Check engine light came on and the car stalled. Cylinder two misfire. So he calls me. Craig, hey, listen, check engine lights on. Car stalled. It's running real rough. God, that's that's awful. Take it back. Uh, bring it back to me. Let me check it out. Now I drove that car from the auction to here. I picked my son up in it one day. So I don't know, maybe I put 40 miles on it myself. Never, never had a check engine light. Never had a misfire. Like there was no lifter tapping, nothing. I tell him, like, listen, bring it right back. Let me figure it out. I put on the scanner, cylinder two misfire. I do a coil and plug, which was a lot of work because the intake actually had to come off. So we did remove the intake. We had to do an intake manifold gasket, plug, coil. It was way more work than just doing plug and coil. So we finished the job. I'm like, all right, I, don't, I wanna make sure this is good. I leave my shop. I drive 15 minutes to go pick up my son from school at baseball practice. I drive back here. I drove home. I drove back here again. And the reason being, I wanna make sure it's good for him. And like, there are certain monitors in a car that need to be checked. There are eight monitors in an emission system. So I don't want the check engine light to come on. I need to set all the monitors. So I just drive this car and I keep driving. I keep driving. I wanna put the miles on. It's typically like a hundred miles you have to drive to set all the monitors. I made it to like 80 miles, brought it back. And like the monitors weren't ready. There were still two monitors that were not ready yet. So I call him, I'm like, hey, this thing's running great. I drove it all day yesterday. I drove it today. Come on and grab it. So he picks it up, drives home. The next day I get a call. Craig, check engine lights back on. Things running wrong. So I know like now it's going to be a big deal. It's going to be a pain in the butt. And I didn't price this Jeep accordingly. So it's so like, all right, that's awful. Bring it back. Okay, he didn't buy a warranty for this car. So like, I don't have to do anything legally. That isn't the point. And it isn't the point that I know that we're, we have an acquaintance, a similar acquaintance that has nothing to do with this. I want, I would always make sure they're taken care of, especially since I said, yeah, these engines are great. I would put my family in it. You're good. So he brings it back. I put it on my trailer. So I'm like, listen, you know what? Look at my headliner. It's obviously more work than we can do. Do you have a mechanic you use? Maybe he can look at it and they can go through it and just tell me what it is and I'll try to take care of it for you. He's like, oh no, we buy new cars. We don't have a mechanic we use. So I'm like, perfect. All right, I'll take it to the Jeep dealer then just bring it back to me. So he brings it back to me. I put it on my trailer. I go 40 minutes to the Jeep dealer. I drop it off at six o'clock at night. I get a call at 9 a.m. this morning. Craig, yeah, it needs a head. Like, well, why does it need a head? Oh, well, cylinder two misfire. That's what we diagnosed it as. I'm like, did you pull anything apart? What, what did you look at? And they're like, well, no, we didn't have to pull anything apart. We know these. So yeah, it needs an entire head. I'm like, an entire head? That doesn't even make sense. Like, did a valve, like, is there a valve issue? Is there a lifter issue? What is the actual problem? Oh, we didn't dig that deep. So they didn't look into it to actually know what the fault was. And I'm not gonna pay Jeep new car store prices for them to just throw parts at it when they didn't even fully diagnose it. I go pick it up, I write him a check. He gives me the old lifter and I pay him $900 and I'm off. I get it back to my shop and instead of calling the buyer, I gave the car to my mechanic to drive. I want him to drive it home that night. I want to drive it back in, like drive this thing so we know it's good. He drives it all the way home. He calls me that night. He's like, hey, this thing's running great. Perfect. He drives to pick up his daughter from something, calls me. He's like, hey, this thing's great. The next morning on the way here, check engine light comes on. So it's not just a lifter. It's worse than that. So I call the customer. Hey, Mr. Customer, listen, it's going to take longer. I got to bring it back to the repair shop. So now I brought it here to the Jeep dealer, Jeep dealer to the mechanic, the mechanic back here, and now back to the mechanic. So like I'm taking a lot of time out of my own personal time to try to take care of this thing. And to be honest with you, me going the extra mile probably is hurting me. And I forgot to mention that twice in this conversation, I offered to buy the Jeep back. So when I realized it wasn't just like a plug in coil, I'm like, hey, you know what? Sometimes it's just better to bring it back and I'll try to find you another Jeep. But here's what happened. Now, like a couple weeks ago, by since I purchased it, the snow's melted, the sun's out, Jeep prices have gone up. So I can't just go to the auction and buy another Jeep for what they paid for it because they actually paid like what I would sell it for at the auction. So now it's just easier for me to buy it back. I'll buy it back, I'll run through the auction, I'll break even, like no loss on my end and they get their money back, it's great. But the daughter fell in love with the Jeep, she wants it. And I've already kind of committed to making sure that we get it taken care of so they want it. Like we're past this point of let me buy it back for you. So now another week goes by, customers calling me like, Craig, where's the Jeep? I'm calling the auto repair shop. They don't speak English, so they can't answer me. And the guy's starting to get mad with good reason. Like, where is his Jeep that he just paid $13,000, $14,000 for? Whatever. Where is his daughter's Jeep? His daughter's going to be 16 next week. This is her first car. This is her sweet 16 car. She's all excited for it. She put pink door handles all over it. And, like, she made it her own car, and she loves this car already, which is why she didn't want to just, like, sell it back to me. So here's the problem. I've offered to buy it back twice. They didn't want to sell it back. Like, let's fix this thing. Let's figure out what's wrong. I am going on vacation the week 
week she turns 16 with my family. Like this is the big vacation that I do with my family every year. It's the end of my busy, busy, busy season. Tax season's over. This is like, I've worked from Labor Day all the way till the end of tax season, seven days a week from sun up to sundown and I am mentally exhausted. And then I just start, everything starts to slow down. So I do a big vacation with my family, we chill out and then I can come back and just coast until the next Labor Day when we start hustling again. Well now instead of just being on vacation with my family, I have this Jeep hanging over my head because my shop's open. So like every day we're trying to, I'm talking to the customer, I'm talking to the office management, I'm just like talk, trying to get in touch with the mechanic who's working on this thing to schedule this 16 year old girl getting her car on her 16th birthday. It's like super important, right for everybody. I, I want to make sure that she gets her car on her 16th birthday as well. So like I'm at SeaWorld and I'm in line for a ride and I'm checking my phone, texting people instead of like focusing on my kids. I'm at Discovery Cove and instead of laying in the sun with my wife, I'm like messaging, calling, trying to coordinate pickups and arrangements and parts and have people that speak Spanish call the shop so we can translate things. And then I'm at Bush Gardens and like I'm getting frustrated and short tempered when I'm supposed to be on vacation with my family focusing 100% on my family. And I'm not. I'm priority number one is what's going on at work. How am I going to handle this situation? This customer's mad at me. I want to make sure they're satisfied. I want to make sure this girl gets her car. Meanwhile, my wife and my kids are getting like not 100% of my attention, which isn't fair to them either. So here's the great thing. I am at a water park all day in Florida, texting back and forth. Like we get off the lazy river, I check my phone because now it's this girl's birthday. She gets home from school. We want her car to be there, but I'm in Florida. So I'm like, I, we get off the lazy river and I'm checking my text to with the mechanic to go get the car and then texting our manager to make sure that we have a ride to go get the car. So it's back here in time for us to get detailed all day long. It's the girl's birthday. I'm with my family on our last like big day and I'm not present with my family, which sucks. It's not fair to my family and it really bums me out. Good news is the mechanic finishes the Jeep in time. My help, like everybody that helps me out, picked up the Jeep. They brought it back. It got detailed. Everything worked out exactly as it was supposed to happen. He came with his daughter and his wife. They picked up their Jeep. He texted me back, said everything's great. They love it. It's like best case scenario. Now the repairs were about $3,500. Like I'm already $3,500 into these repairs out of my own pocket. So I had said to him like, hey, listen, I had no warranty. I'm trying to do the best I can to make this right in a bad situation. Can you cover like 1200 bucks? If you can cover 1200, I'll cover the entire balance on my own and we'll just like hope your, your daughter got a good car and everything's good. He's like, yep, you know what? That is fair. He paid $1,200 out of pocket and I paid the remaining balance. It cost me like 2200 or something like that, $2,300 that I paid. So that was my profit. So now this Jeep is his zero profit car and my biggest stressor for an entire month and ruined some of my family vacation. But his daughter got her car on her 16th birthday. Birthday. We came through and everything worked out exactly how it's supposed to be, right? Yes, until five days later. Now, I had already gotten the text saying, hey, everything's great. Thank you so much. We love the Jeep. Beautiful. Like, best case scenario. I am so pumped about this. Five days go by. I get a text that says, hey, Craig, check engine light came back on again. Oh no, God! So this Jeep headache that has consumed a month of my time that I was so excited that it was over with, even though I just broke even on it, still is a headache that is not fixed. And I'm $2,500 deeper out of my own pocket for a non-profit car. I just got back from vacation. I'm like settling back into work and the shop and kind of coordinating things. I just wasn't ready for that. So I gave it just like a debt, probably two days that I didn't respond. I just need to like collect my bearings, figure out, all right, now what? Then I get another message. Needs like whatever repairs were made wasn't fixed. It's like another three grand to fix it. So everything that we did that we paid three grand for wasn't fixed correctly. It's going to cost another three grand to do exactly the same thing plus whatever they didn't do. Now the work is covered under warranty. The warranty, if I could get it to them and if I spoke Spanish, but no matter what, like I could get it to them and have the repairs made. So I messaged and I'm like, all right, let's figure this out. It's this cylinder, it's under warranty. We have to work on getting it back. I understand the customer is going to be pissed at me because now he's $1,200 deeper into this car that his daughter loves and is starting to hate. It's her first car, it's her first experience with buying a car. All of it on his end has just been completely, completely negative for him, his wife, and his daughter. Like that's just not fair to them. And I know that it is not fair to them and it sucks for them. So it doesn't just suck for me. It's on both sides. It's just a shitty situation. That was a Friday. I come in Monday and I find out the young girl crashed the Jeep. She got in a car accident. She was taking a turn and then like cut in front of somebody. Somebody slammed into her, crashed the Jeep. She's okay. So as soon as I find out she's okay, I'm like, oh God, I hope that Jeep
Jeep is totaled, if it's totaled like all of our problems, for them and for us, it's over with. The Jeep's gone, it's out of our hair. They'll get a big fat check, more than what they paid for it. Like that is a best case scenario. The girl's safe, she's not injured. Jeep is gone and, and they're paid. Like awesome, I'm so happy to hear that. Come to find out, it's not totaled. It's just banged up on like a bunch of areas and it's not running right. So now they're really unhappy because their Jeep that isn't running right is now also crashed. So now, I can only assume that he is fuming. Like they're done with this Jeep. I would be done with this Jeep. They have good reason. It's not running right. It's now crashed. Like this Jeep is cursed, okay? It is what it is. I would, if I was them, call it a lemon, all right? It's a bummer. That reflects on me, okay? So let me go back to my friend that recommended me. A good friend, like my kid does sports with his kid. We did sports together when we were kids. My dad knows his brother. Like we go really far back and have a good relationship. And actually I look up to him and admire him and he is always helping me out okay so like he's throwing me business all the time which is awesome now I look terrible to my friends because I sold a car one of their friends that is just an absolute headache for them and they're upset so they get upset at like they within right I'm sure they didn't but they could they have the right to be kind of annoyed with my friend because he recommended me so now he looks bad so not only do I look bad but my friend also looks bad for recommending me and I put my name on something that isn't good which is now getting to the point finally where I would love your opinions. Before I get into the final kicker, I want to know what you guys would do to this point. How would you handle if you were the owner of the Jeep, what would your expectations be? If you were me, the owner of the business that is now zero dollars profit on a car, like I'm at a break even point on a car that I sold in a month of my time and stress into, how would you handle if you were me and the seller? Like that, I, I'm pretty sure I know what I would do. And me personally, I offered to buy back again. Like that sucks. I think I did. I think I offered to buy it back a third time. I don't remember, but no matter what, like I will. At this point, I would buy it back. I forget if I offered to it yet or not, but I would if that was like the option. That is not the option though, because they crashed it. So I can't buy it back though, because the daughter now crashed the Jeep. So it doesn't run right and they crashed it. So I can't buy it back now. I don't even know what I can do to improve this situation. Would even be fair. So here's where it gets greasy. The mom messages my manager because they're friends. So they're going back and forth. I'm going back and forth with the dad trying to figure out what's fair. Then my friend's wife messages me to say, hey, it looks bad. Hope you're going to make it right. So that isn't even a scenario or a situation I want to be in personally or have them feel like they need to be in. So that sucks. The mother messages my manager and says, would you be able to be willing to buy it back for the purchase price? We'll suck up the $1,200. But the Jeep is wrecked, like bumper push bar, fender, plastic fender, the wheels kinked in, the metal fender is dented, the door is dented, and then the rocker panel, which is a unibody structural, is dented. Like there's a significant amount of work, but just based off photos, who knows what's behind everything because she got clipped, like almost T-bone, but in the front corner. So it's more than $1,200 worth of damage. So both, I spoke to the father and mother, they want me to buy the Jeep back damaged for the price they paid and they'll eat the $1,200. Now they want me to buy back, I'm gonna say it again, they want me to buy back a crash Jeep for the price they paid minus the $1,200 that they paid for the engine repair. So they'll lose 1200 bucks, I get a crashed Jeep still with an engine problem. This is where this job gets difficult. No matter what I do, I'm going to be a bad guy now to multiple people, my friend and these people. Even if I buy it back, like even if I just take the loss and buy a crashed Jeep for what they paid, I am forever going to be a bad guy. Like, oh, that guy sold me a dud, sold me a lemon, whatever. They're not going to be happy with me and forever. And if I see him in the mall, it's going to be like, ah, oh, that's the guy that sold me that Jeep. Don't buy from him. Even though I try to take care of it, it's not going to help. So I am going to be a bad guy. There's more to it than that. The mother posted on Facebook, does anybody know a Jeep dealer that does repairs? I bought a Jeep for my daughter and it had engine problems and the dealer took it back and said they fixed it and then they didn't. And then we had to drive it back again and then they said they fixed it and charged us $1,200 and then they didn't fix it. So nowhere in that did it ever say like they paid 600 the first time. They paid 1200 the first time. Me, me, the dealer. The dealer paid 600 the first time and took it back right away. The dealer took it to a, a repair shop on his own dime and paid them on his own dime. And like none of that was in a Facebook post. They didn't say my name, which was very thankful and I appreciate that very much. But like the people that know, know. Like if you know them, they know me. They like three different set degrees of separation. They know me. So now my name is on Facebook as well. Like don't buy from that guy. It's a bad story on Facebook. So now like I'm slightly smeared on Facebook. I burnt a bridge with a friend I hope I didn't but quite possibly could have and the wife of the friend messaged me and said I hope you're gonna make it right which is what what's the right 
scenario. I don't even know. They didn't file an insurance claim either. So have, if they filed an insurance claim, it's easily four to $5,000 worth of damage. So if I buy it back, it's gonna have four to $5,000 worth of damage. My manager came up with a great solution that was have them fix the repairs and I buy it back for the purchase price. That's fair, then I'm buying it in the condition that I sold it in. Like that is probably the most fair, but that's not how they're gonna wanna do it. They want me to buy it back for what they paid and take on all the accident damage and anything that could be behind it. So. I don't know. I would love to know. That's the end of the story. I, I haven't made a solution yet. I haven't come up with a solution yet. I just like to make these videos because I want you to know, like, Mike, use car dealer. Used car dealers are hated. And, like, in this scenario, if this, if the buyer says it out loud, everyone would hate me. But there's two sides to every story. And even when I try to do the right part as the, the used car dealer, I'm going to be a bad guy no matter what. And that is never, ever, ever what I want. And I don't really know how to make it right unless like without losing my shirt and keep in mind I have three kids and I have a family and I have a crazy amount of bills like the, it, to keep this place afloat is just insane I have to find the middle ground where everybody is content no one's probably going to be happy and you don't want one person mad and the other person happy like where is the line drawn where everybody's just content and they can walk away satisfied and I can walk away and just say oh, I'm glad that's over with I don't know I would love to know like your solutions what what would you guys do in this scenario am I right like, should I just buy it back wrecked? Should they fix it? Should I just be the jerk and say, nope, sorry, you're on your own because I'm going to be a jerk no matter what anyway, which isn't my option. That's not an option for me, but I don't know. Some people would, and it would be the easiest option for them. But I have to sleep at night, and I have to bump into people, and, like, you just can't have it, though. You can't run your business that way long term. I don't know what to do, but I make this video probably as therapy, number one. And uh, what would you do so you guys get to see what behind the scene actually looks like? owning a car dealership because it's not always great. It's not always easy. And like, I have to be a bad guy sometimes. Well, that's it, that's it for this video.